Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and start. Um, I'm Anna. I'm one of the first year fellows presenting at uh, PD Journal Club this morning. Um, and so the study that I'm uh, presenting, it's a study entitled uh, the use of a decision aid for patients considering PD and in-center dialysis, a randomized controlled trial. Um, it was published in April 2019 in AJKD, and it's actually the third portion of um, a larger study called um, Empowering Patients on Choices for Renal Replacement Therapy, or the EPOC or RT trial. Um, and the aim of the whole study was to, to identify patient priorities and um, gaps in shared decision-making to inform kind of the development or the creation of a new web-based decision aid that would provide like relevant information for the two most um, wild, widely used dialysis options. So in-center dialysis, in-center hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. And so just some background, at least in 2015, according to the US RDS report, um, more than 120,000 patients in the US started dialysis for ESRD. A great majority started um, in-center hemodialysis as their first treatment modality. Much less, about 10% started PD, and even less, about 0.4% started home HD. And studies have looked at the differential mortality between dialysis modalities. One study found that um, selection bias actually accounted for any differences that they found between the two modality choices when it came to mortality. Um, and despite this, despite mortality kind of rates being fairly the same, uh, PD is much less commonly used, especially in the US. Um, and in a study by Song et al. in 2013, a good majority, about 67% of patients felt that they had no choice about starting dialysis or dialysis modalities. Um, a small percentage, about 20%, felt like they were rushed to make a decision. And about a third of the patient population in that study felt that the decision was already made for them by their physician. And um, uh, it makes sense, and studies have also supported that treatments consistent with patient preferences may improve quality of life and therefore potentially improve medical outcomes. Um, additionally, because most patients are candidates for both PD and hemodialysis, the decision really should be based on patient preferences, taking into their lifestyles. Um, and so I kind of just wanted to start this off more kind of for my curiosity, and this is one of the reasons why I wanted to do this paper. We're all kind of fairly new in our nephrology careers, and um, I wanted to get the sense from you guys in your clinics, particularly with patients who are in the more advanced stages of their CKD, how often have you had to have uh, conversations about renal replacement therapy? Do you guys have an approach that you developed? Um, do you guys use different things um, to help the patient make a decision or explain the, the dialysis modalities? Um, how have those conversations gone? Do you think they've been effective, productive, helpful for the patient? And any attendings who are listening to can obviously chime in on their experience and what their approaches are. For Dr. Gulper and I, we uh, will very frequently have these conversations with folks and we, if we have the luxury of time, uh, if somebody's not referred to us very late, then we'll have these conversations multiple times over uh, multiple visits that are relatively closely spaced out. And we also leverage uh, our NPs to help us to do uh, uh, further uh, education for these folks because uh, it's a lot of new information for them and something that they're not used to. And so repetition is, I think, the key to success. Um, 
And just briefly, we, uh, or at least I will usually uh, bring it up by being very blunt that given, you know, say the trajectory of things or uh, uh, if I see it as relatively far out, but wanting to prepare them for the future that could involve dialysis, I'll soften the blow uh, with that idea, but just introduce the concept. And uh, we feel that giving patients uh, some knowledge and some uh, vision of what the future could hold and empowering them in that uh, dimension uh, can help to make uh, what can be a tough transition a lot less scary. And I think, I think that's uh, how far I'll go with that and other people can chime in for some of the other questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, me and uh, Dr. El Shami have, I think, um, started talking to patients about it too. And I would see Dr. El Shami frequently kind of give them a pretty detailed explanation in clinic. Um, again, if you have time, about the different modalities, both home and um, home PD and home hemo. And I think one thing which I really like um, the way Dr. El Shami does it is that he encourages patients to go visit a home mm -hmm. dialysis unit to mm -hmm. kind of see what it looks like, kind of see what the machines look like and, you know, what they have to do, the patients have to do on a daily basis, um, which helps the patients visualize it more than just, you know, me us telling them, but also helps them visualize what they will be doing for the rest of their lives. Um, I think that really helps a lot too. Mm -hmm. So uh, this, this guy, this guy, Dr. El Shami sounds good. I don't know. Okay. This guy, uh, El Shami, yeah, that's, uh, anyway, uh, uh, Dr. Rodby is on from, uh, 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 Raj, but, uh, and Roger, well, I'm going to hear what you do, but, but one of the things is, uh, uh Gayla East is one of the nurses in the home unit and she has been, uh, and Dr. Solani has been working on uh, making a uniform, uh, presentation. So Gayla meets with those people. If you send them to the home unit and then, uh, it's, uh, uh our nurse practitioner Wang and also, uh, Mary Sori. Uh, so we've got a whole variety of, of that infrastructure. Uh, and and uh, uh, Peter uh, and Taran uh, both said the word repetitive and frequent mm -hmm. because it has to be iterative as they go and they pick up something from either a patient or a nurse, then they need to bring that back to you to discuss it, to, to kind of uh, quell uh, anxieties or, or <clears throat> Or, uh, misunderstandings. Uh, Roger, if you're, I think I saw you on, uh, why don't you comment on what happens up at Rush? Yeah, so um, I realized my microphone on, so I'm sitting here hacking away. Uh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so what we have, we have something called Kidney University, which we sent them to, and uh, it was a little easier to do for COVID, but you know, maybe once a month we would have a few patients come in and they'd sit and we'd show them. Um, you know, the different modalities, show them, talk them through a little, you know, a little, little presentation on hemo, home hemo and PD, um, and then kind of, you know, meet with them a little later and see if they have any thoughts. I think it's, it was pretty helpful. I don't know how effective it is now with, with what's going on with COVID. I just purely ignorance right now. I can't tell you, but you know, it's pretty helpful. Um, in the end, it's really, really important that the primary physician knows the patient long enough to have a relationship to kind of point him in some direction um, that, you know, it doesn't matter how much information you tell somebody in decision making, I mean, we're still doctors, and I think still patients still really, really look up to us for answers. Yeah, I think building on that point, and not as well, because I know you have, a, have your presentation to give uh, Anna, uh, but um, you know, I think uh, it's important for, or at least I find that it's important for us to be the ones to break the ice with the patient, right, conversation-wise. Yes, we do have these resources, right, that we can send our patients to, but I think that it's, you know, it's better if, if we're the ones who start the conversation with the patient just so that they know what they're getting into. Yes, you know, Gayla uh, or, you know, uh, Jen Wang, well, can can speak further to it, you know, to the different modalities and what they have. But I think, you know, like you know, Dr. Rodby said, these patients, right? They trust us, and I think being a part of that from the beginning is helpful for the patients uh, themselves because then afterwards they can meet with with them, they have an idea of what's going on, and then they could, they can come back with follow up questions to us. Mm -hmm. Right. So it sounds like these um, informational sessions or presentations are definitely more to supplement 
um, the initial uh, conversations with the nephrologist. Um, okay. And so um, talking about different types of decision-making models, um, there are several that have been um, kind of reported um, in the medical field. So one of them being parental, the paternalistic model, where basically us as providers decide the plan of care moving forward. Um, as you kind of go along, it progressively includes the patient, um, but HCP as the best agent model is where we kind of decide the, the treatment moving forward, but we do consider patient preferences and lifestyles based on what we know about them already. Informed decision-making is where the patient kind of themselves is the driver. Um, they decide for themselves and not, and not necessarily with collaboration with, a, with their physician. And I think the most important one um, is shared decision-making model, which is per, perhaps the most common, particularly, particularly when it comes to initiating dialysis. Um, and each model can be a valid or appropriate decision-making model in different contexts or situations. And like I said, current clinical practice guidelines recommend um, involving patients and their care partners in the dialysis modality decision-making. So hence a shared decision-making type of model. And this can include use of a patient decision aid to support um, this process for them. And it sounds like at least at Vanderbilt or at Rush, it's very much a collaborative process and one where we do over multiple visits, ideally. Um, but there have been studies that have shown that many patients do not feel like they were given an active choice in their modality. Um, additionally, observational studies suggest that uh, failure to elicit these types of um, patient individual preferences or circumstances um, can lead to treatment non-adherence. Um, and it's been found that shared decision-making can increase satisfaction, reduce anxiety, again, improve compliance, and perhaps lower demand for healthcare resources. Um, and in fact, in a Cochrane review, um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but use of uh, patient decision aids, also PDAs, for individuals seeking care, facing, um, you know, having to make a decision versus those who did not, those who, did have a decision aid, felt they were better informed and had a more active role when choosing their treatments. So what is a decision aid? Um, basically, it's an evidence-based tool designed to help make specific and deliberate choices among different healthcare options. So in a sense, it's supposed to be a little bit different than your usual like healthcare informational, maybe pamphlets that you see um, lying around in doctor's offices. Um, they're supposed to provide unbiased information to improve understanding of the disease process and the treatment options. So, and it's supposed to be a bit more of an active rather than a passive process. Um, it's supposed to explore options and potential personalized outcomes for the patient. Um, and these can be in the form of booklets, interactive media, um, video or audio sessions. And there is actually criteria for decision aids that were developed by what sounds like maybe a society, the International Patient Decision Aid Standards. Um, and again, basically they're supposed to have balanced information and they're supposed to include references to funding sources and any um, additional resources on information um, used to develop the decision aid. And there are um, existing patient decision aids out there currently that help patients choose between modalities. A few are outside the US and some of them do include renal transplant as, a, as a, an option for end-stage renal disease. Um, what is supposed to be different about this study was that it was developed um, with an advisory panel um, that consisted of patients, patient caregivers, i.e. their family members, any other patient representatives and patient advocacy organizations, all as collaborators throughout all aspects of the study. Um, so they were there for several iterations of the decision aid that was developed. Um, and this is also, I guess, one of the few decisional decision aids that was studied to assess 
the actual efficacy in CKD patients, at least in the US. And so, like I mentioned earlier, uh, this study um, was actually the third portion of a larger study. The first aim or the first part of the study was um, the goal was to identify factors that were most important in CKD and end-stage renal patients at the time of choosing their dialysis modalities and what may have contributed to their decision. Um, and they did this through semi-structured interviews and they kind of pulled themes based on those interviews. And then in the second aim, they developed and implemented a survey um, based on the interviews, um, assessing the decision-making process, the impact of this decision on daily lives, um, and the satisfaction with the dialysis modalities. And so the third aim, which was this study, was to address a need for an easily accessible, freely available decision aid uh, based on the data collected from aim one and two. So I probably should have made this, oh, I don't think you can see it, but um, I probably should have made that a link, choosingdialysis.org. That's actually the decision aid that they came up with for the study and that they used um, um, between for their intervention. Um, the sections on the, or the uh, decision aid com, uh, consisted of sections on CKD and its progression. It included information on the comparison of .hd and pd on patient priorities and included any positive and negative features of each option, um, options for switching, um, potential associated lifestyle changes, side effects for both. Um, and it's kind of, I think it's kind of cool. I haven't looked at the other existing decision aids that are out there, but um, it kind of includes like anecdotes and quotes of actual patients um, that were collected from the first two aims of the study. It had like hover over definitions to help people understand the terminology. Um, and so um, the study design, it was a randomized control trial. Um, subjects were randomized to one or more, or uh, to the control arm or the intervention arm. Um, and it was all done um, kind of at a single center, University of Michigan. Um, what they did do though, was they kind of recruited patients from social media, like, um, like different social media platforms, as well as um, from seven local clinics in um, Michigan. And this was all between May 2015 and December 2015. The criteria, you had to be 18 years or older, you had to have a GFR less than 25, you did have to have internet access, um, and you had to be fluent in English. So there might be some limitations already that you can see. And so these were their primary outcomes. So they looked at treatment preferences for the control group and the intervention group. They looked at decisional conflict, this decisional self-efficacy, uh, preparation for decision-making and knowledge. And I'll go through each one of those. Um, so you can see the type of uh, questionnaires that, they, um, that the participants went through. Um, and so this is kind of the overall study design. So the control arm only really had to uh, complete one questionnaire. And you can see here, um, they did all of these, the treatment preferences, they did questionnaires on decisional conflict, decision self-efficacy. They did kind of like this quiz on CKD, ESRD, and dialysis options. Um, everyone did have to go through um, kind of like a brief literacy and numeracy kind of testing, um, and then answer some demographic questions. In the intervention group, so they basically did the same thing as the control group, except they did their knowledge testing or their quiz after going through a decision aid or the website. And then after going through the, oops, after going through the website, they did have to go through another questionnaire, the preparation for decision making to kind of assess how effective the decision aid was at helping them make the decision, as well as just kind of answer a few questions about their user experience with the website. 
And so this is the first outcome or the second, the first one was treatment preferences. Um, and basically they just had to decide based on what they knew at the time, uh, what modality they would choose either in, in center dialysis or PD. So this second outcome was decisional conflict. So just to kind of elaborate, um, it's to measure perceived baseline uncertainty in treatment choice. So it might be a little hard to see, but participants were asked about the choice they were about to make via a 16 item questionnaire listed here. Um, responses were based on like a five point Likert scale. So one being strongly agree, five, um, yeah, five being strongly disagree. So some of the questions or comments they had to address if it's hard to see include, I'm unsure what to do in this decision. This decision is hard for me. I'm aware of the choices I have for dialysis. I feel I know the risks and side effects of each type of dialysis. Um, I need more advice and information about the types of dialysis. And then the second outcome was looking at decisional self-efficacy. That is looking at how confident participants felt about their ability to make an informed decision. So it's based on 10 items, again, based on a five point Likert scale. Um, and they were asked to look at the following comments that were involved in making an informed decision and were asked to show how confident they felt doing these things. So if, if it's hard to see some examples were, I feel confident that I can get the facts about the benefits of each type of dialysis. I feel confident that I can express my concerns about each type of dialysis. Uh, I feel confident that I can ask for advice. I feel confident that I can handle um, unwanted pressure from others in making my choice. And then um, another outcome was the validated preparation for decision-making scale. So again, this was only done in the intervention arm after using the, dial the decision aid. Um, and it was to assess their readiness for communicating with practitioners about making their healthcare decision. Um, so this was again, also based on a 10 item scale uh, and a five point Likert response format. So I'll just read a few if it's hard to see for yourself. Um, um, so basically, did the decision aid website help you recognize that a decision needs to be made help you think about what pros and cons are most important, help you identify questions you want to ask your doctor at your follow-up visit. And then this was um, the knowledge testing that the control arm um, did as well as the intervention arm did after the decision aid. So it consisted of 23 questions on renal disease, as well as PD and in-center dialysis. Um, these questions were adapted from um, the Chronic Hemodialysis Knowledge Survey. I think it was developed um, in Australia, and it has been used in other studies. Um, it has been shown to correlate with clinical outcomes based on the knowledge testing people have. So the knowledge questions, um, some examples that I just kind of pulled out. Um, I think you guys can read some of those there, but where are your kidneys? Um, what are the main functions of your kidneys? And then it does, it does look at um, kind of equal questions with PD and HD. So like, how does PD work? How does HD work? What are the side effects of PD? What are the side effects of HD? Um, also, if you skip dialysis, uh, what happens? Um, Things like that. I kind of just wanted to put that up there because I thought the answer choices were interesting. And then, so this was um, kind of how um, they went from recruitment to um, randomization. So um, basically, it's a little hard to see, so I'll walk you through it. Um, a large number of patients were recruited at local clinics more than social media outreach. A majority of them did not meet criteria, so about 1,300. Those that did, only a portion were consented. Um, the reason for those who were not consented were 
are kind of listed in that metal box there. Basically, ADH, um, they were not able to reach. 195 were actually found not to be eligible. So 79 didn't, did not have access to a computer. 61 were clinically ineligible. Uh, 35 had already started dialysis in the interim. Two were getting transplant um, and so on and so forth. And then 44 also declined being screened, um, declined participation after being screened. So we were left with um, 50, or they were left with 51 in the social media outreach group that were consented and 183 from clinics that were consented. And so a total of 234 underwent uh, randomization, 116 to the control arm and 118 to the intervention arm. Um, and if you kind of look, almost half in each group, almost half in each group were kind of lost to follow up. Uh, mostly, oh yeah, were lost to follow up. And then ultimately 70 in the control arm completed the actual study, meaning they completed that questionnaire. 70 in the intervention completed the pre-intervention portion. Only 63 went on to complete the post-intervention testing. Um, and then just some briefly on the stats that they did. So they did Pearson chi-square testing and Fisher exact testing for the demographic responses. Looking at control or comparing control and the intervention post-test, they did unpaired T-test, um, a Wil Wilcox and rank sum. Does anyone know what that is? That's okay, I didn't either, but, <laughs> um, but basically, um, if I'm understanding, it's, it's another example of like a non-parametric or distribution-free test. It can be used in place of a pair T test uh, when the data is um, categorical, I guess, in case of the Likert scale being one to five. Um, pre and post testing within the intervention arm, they used pair T testing. Um, and they did do like generalized estimating equation logistic and linear regression models to kind of look at the effects of things like age in the patient. Uh, sex and level of level of education as well as race. And then so starting with the results, looking at the demographics, um, again, so many patients are participants in each group. Uh, participants were pretty similar between the groups regarding age, race, sex, um, education, and ethnicity. It was a largely white population. English was definitely the most common language. You had to speak English. Um, and almost all had completed at least high school education. Um, and if you um, kind of look at the average age for these patients, it's about 60 years old. And um, the study sample is actually a bit younger than the US CKD stage four to five population on these from data in 2014, 2015, where the mean age was about 76 or 77 years old. Um, but they did have a similar proportion of white, white and male participants. Um, and so looking at reduction in uncertainty. So basically they looked at everyone's initial treatment choices and then they looked at the um, intervention arm after going through de the decision aid and looked at how many were still unsure. Um, and so both arms had similar baseline uncertainty on treatment choice, about 40% in the control arm and 47% in the intervention arm pre-testing. After the intervention, the proportion of those not sure uh, was 24 points lower than the corresponding proportion in the control group. Additionally, within the intervention, the proportion of people not sure um, compared to those, the proportion of people not sure before the test compared to those after the test was 30% points lower. And these were all statistically significant. Um, of the 29 participants in the intervention arm who were unsure prior to the intervention, eight remained unsure, 15 selected hemodialysis, 
five selected peritoneal dialysis and one selected other. I'm not really sure what other is. They weren't explicit about that. I'm assuming maybe um, non-dialytic care or transplant. I'm not sure. I could not find that, that information in the paper. Um, and so when they also looked at factors like age, education, race, they did find that um, with, I think it was age and level of education. So older, older participants had a larger difference between control and intervention uh, post-testing when it came to reducing um, um, uh, uncertainty. Mm -hmm. um, this was also uh, true for um, those who had college education versus those who only had some college or less. But um, this actually did not hold statistical significance after correction. So looking at um, reduction in decisional conflict. So remember, this was that 16 item questionnaire that looked at perceived uncertainty in treatment choice. So at baseline, the average decisional conflict score was 43 in the control group and 44 in the intervention group before the use of the decision aid. After the use of the decision aid, the intervention group scored 13 points lower than the control on average. And within the intervention group, looking at pre versus post, the decision aid led to an average 15 point reduction from 44 to 29 in decisional conflict after using the decision aid. So this was both statistically significant. And they, there was no effect uh, modification with age, sex, or race. They did notice kind of the same thing as um, the results when looking at reduction in uncertainty that um, I think it was um, more education led to a larger decrease in decisional conflict, but this also did not um, keep its statistical significance with correction. And then looking at self-efficacy. So remember, this was that 10-point item questionnaire looking at how confident participants felt about making um, a decision. The baseline decisional self-efficacy scores were on the high side for both uh, groups, average about 80, and there was really no statistically significant change in the score um, after use of the decision aid in the intervention group. And then looking at the knowledge testing, so on average, the control arm um, answered 77% of the knowledge questions correctly compared to 90% in the intervention arm after the decision aid. Um, and what they found was black participants in the control arm had lower baseline knowledge compared to non-black participants. Um, however, um, if you were to compare the change in knowledge scores between the control and intervention arm, black participants, they had like a nominally greater increase in their scores compared to non-black participants. So the way I interpret that is they didn't know much in the beginning compared to non-black participants, but they, after the decision aid, they were kind of left at the same, they kind of knew as much as the, um, the control arm and the non-black non -black participants in the control arm. And there was no observed um, effect modification with age, sex, or education level. And there were no, the, the study wasn't really powered to look at other minorities to see if that um, had any difference in knowledge outcomes. Um, and then assessing readiness to make a decision. So again, this was done post-testing only. Um, this was kind of more just um, percentage, looking at the percentages, but you can see that a majority of patients felt at least quote, quite a bit based on the Likert scale to a great deal uh, prepared with making a decision after the decision aid. Um, and yeah, so if we, if we kind of look at on the left-hand side, the darker shades, um, um, they kind of took up most of the 
the responses for each and basically they all kind of, kind of felt the decision aid was helpful. And then they did ask some questions, just like general questions and open-ended feedback um, to assess relevance, usability, and satisfaction. So some questions were based also on a five-point Likert scale and some were open-ended questions. A good majority felt that, this is, that the decision aid was balanced in its information. A good majority felt that they trusted the website content. Um, and 89% agreed that the content was re relevant to them. And about half of the patients agreed that the decision aid was extremely helpful um, in understanding the dialysis options. Um, some of the feedback, like the open-ended feedback that they mentioned, and you can see kind of the themes that they pulled out in the, in the um, table on the side, but one most notably was the lack of information on home HD. And then, so just to kind of um, uh, go through kind of the conclusions or discussions, uh, patient decision aids or PDAs can improve knowledge, provide better preparation, reduce decisional conflict. Um, the decision aid was helpful in advanced CKD patients who were unsure of their treatment options and making them less unsure. But based on this, um, the outcome of self-efficacy, it did not seem to make people who had already selected an option to be less sure or to change their selection. Um, this is, you can, this was just based on the high self-efficacy scores that they saw and how it did not change after use of the decision aid. Um, the extent of the benefit from the decision aid on reducing uncertainty um, and decisional conflict may vary with age or education, um, which um, did not remain statistically significant in this study, but further studies perhaps could look into that more. And differences in the um, knowledge test between Black and non-Black participants may be related to uh, racial disparities in treatment choice, which we all know is well documented. And then um, some limitations. I mean, overall, I like the study. There are a few limitations, but I think the intent was good, at least from a budding nephrologist who's still trying to come up with a, a good approach to having these type of conversations. Um, the study tried to assess an important aspect for us providing care. And while our aim is always to never have to have these conversations because we're doing such a good job at delaying progression that renal you know, replacement therapy is not you know, a foreseeable thing in the patient's um, future. Um, it gives uh, me, at least a way to better understand shared decision, shared decision making, as well as provide a tool that I can maybe have patients take a look at on their free time that would supplement, um, you know, kind of in clinic um, conversations over time. Um, there is a generalizability issue. So this study population, as I mentioned earlier, was healthier, more educated, and younger than the US CKD population. Um, these participants had pretty high literacy rates. Almost all had high school educations and almost all were native English speakers. Additionally, patients needed to have um, access to the internet. Um, some other things to think about that could affect um, participation. Um, so I don't think the study really commented on like all the comorbidities, burdens, medication burdens that um, these CKD patients have and how that could affect their ability to be able to participate in these kinds of decision needs. Um, uh, another thing is the decision-making outcomes were only assessed kind of immediately after the exposure to the decision aid. So it really only can kind of comment on the short-term effects of this decision aid instead of you know, longer term, you know, if patients were to still kind of think about all um, the potential 
side effects, how it could um, further complicate um, their, uh, their lifestyle. Um, another thing that I wasn't really clear about was proof of completion. So um, the study said that patients in the intervention arm did have to click a submit button after going through the website or the decision aid in order to progress to the post-testing. Um, but it, I mean, it's hard. You can easily click a button without actually going through, you know, the decision aid. So it's hard to really say how thoroughly patients went through that. Um, yeah. And that's all I have. Any questions? Uh I uh, I sent you guys uh, a chapter that Marty Schreiber and I wrote a number of years ago, uh, and whether you whether you don't read it, that I totally understand that, but it's about how we approach it. But there is a figure in there, uh, a decision tree, mm -hmm. which I think is critical, and I think Anna, you you uh, you really highlighted why the MD has to be involved and and. I know uh, Francesca Tentori pretty well. She was on the faculty here for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, she's the only MD on this paper. So the mm -hmm. rest of the paper is PhDs. And mm -hmm. Francesca doesn't take care of patients anymore. She And she really didn't, it, it, it's a long story. Uh, but this has been an interest of hers since she was here mm -hmm. 10, 15 years ago. And um, uh, the, I think the, the last reference is a paper I wrote back 20 years ago, and we had some data in that paper on this, there isn't any question that education of patients helps them. What, the problem is, what's the best form? And, and you highlighted the biases of this one. All these people had internet access. It, uh, uh, they were all younger people, so a little, little bit more savvy with uh, um, uh, social media. Uh, no one knows the right way, but, but what I'm coming down to is a point that uh, Roger made uh, and Osama uh, made about knowing your patients. And the only way you can know your patients is to spend time with them, asking them the, the questions about what makes them tick. And uh, that's how you help them. Then, of course, the medical issues, uh, somebody who's had massive abdominal surgery three or four times at a PD is just not likely. Uh, so the doctor has to be involved. And here, my, my message, that's obvious. You all know that. But my message to you is that can be a lot of fun. That can be one of the most gratifying things that you will do in nephrology is helping people make the decision that is seems to be the closest thing to the right decision for them. That is just very gratifying. And I urge all of you to, to get involved with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll just comment, at least based on my short experience as a fellow, a lot of the patients that I've met in my clinic who are kind of advanced, they kind of already had a sense of what they wanted based on multiple conversations they have had um, um, in their prior follow-ups, which, you know, is always the ideal, like we were saying, repetition of um, bringing this conversation up is always key. Um, but there have been new patients that I started um, seeing uh, who were referred kind of further on and no one had really gone over um, the dialysis options. So um, it's kind of um, in those situations, I'm at least able to start to get a sense of how I want to have these conversations. And obviously I did always plan to have these conversations over a number of close follow-ups just because there's such a large volume of information that I didn't want to dump on the patient. Um, so yes, I, I do agree. I think the most important um, part of all of this is the discussion with the physician. Maybe a decision aid is something people can spend time with at home to further answer their questions in the meantime until follow the next follow-up. Hi, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, this, this is Roger again. I have uh, several comments. Uh, first of all, Anna, very nice job. Um, I think, you know, these aids are helpful. It's just like our dialysis uh, university we send people to, they're helpful, but you can't take away 
again, what I said earlier about, you know, knowing your patient, knowing them well enough, and them knowing you well enough to trust you and what you kind of tell them. So often in the end, you know, we think that educating patients, they can make the decision. I know that's the way, that's the way it's been. And compared to the old days when, you know, you would just tell a patient, this is the way it is. They, they were not educated. They were, they were talking a long time ago, but that was clearly the way things were. You just, doctors told patients what to do. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes it's shifted a little too far back the other way because they still need our guidance. Um, and so I, you know, this is something I preach all the time. It's our responsibility as physicians to guide our patients into what, you know, you don't, you don't bully them into anything, but I think it's important. They're looking for our help. And I don't think you can ever underplay how important it is for them to, for you to tell them, I think this would be a good idea for you. Not just, what do you think? You know, I, I, I think that's copping out, uh, personally. Um, in an ideal world, you know your patient for many years, their creatinine is two and then three, and then you say, you know, this is heading the wrong way. Then the next visit you talk about your options and including transplant in there. And and, and I, again, a real perfect world, you can preemptively transplant them, but um, this is not how it works oftentimes. And patients don't come back and they don't want to listen and they won't go to kidney university and they won't do the, this kind of a, they won't do this kind of a, a, a tool or they don't have a computer access or, or whatever it is. They just don't want to deal with it and they end up you know falling in your lap and needing dialysis mm -hmm. which is which is a real problem um enough of my preaching you know i i'm sorry i got pulled away for a couple calls so i, mi I missed this about the article but i want i have a question for you and, and it's a simple one i looked at the tables peripherally pretty quickly so i don't know if that's the case but is there did they actually look at what do you think you would do before you went to the course and did that did the course change your mind in other words i look at you know, I look at this education, and we're all home dialysis kind of oriented, or we wouldn't be on this on this uh, Zoom today. Did, was there any evidence that it changed your mind that I, you know, I never thought I thought I was going to go on hemo and now I'm going on PD. Um, yeah. I know it, 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 it increased everyone's confidence in what they wanted to do, but it did it change anybody's preconceived notion. In other words, just something to, did did it did this um, increase the likelihood that somebody went on PD? So, so looking at the decisional conflict um, outcome within the intervention group um, for uh, those that went through the decision aid, there was a 13.4 uh, point reduction in decisional um, conflict, um, which was statistically significant. And it did comment that I think there were like 29 patients who, um, 29. 29 patients who were unsure. Um, and after going through the, the inter, uh, yeah, the, di the decision aid, um, eight did remain unsure, but 15 were able, or a total of 20 were able to make a, a dialysis modality decision. 15 went to dialysis, hemodialysis, five went to peritoneal dialysis. Right. So that's not surprising. They were able to make a decision. The question is, did it change their mind? You know, because General, mm -hmm. you know, the default is hemo, and it takes some effort right. to get somebody on PD. And I want to know, did this kind of effort effort increase that? Yeah, so I, I think what you're getting at, for those who had already kind of had a, a, um, a decision beforehand, whether it's HD or PD. So there was, I think, one participant in each group that did switch to the other. Is that kind of what you're asking? Yeah, and that's a real shame. I mean, I you know, that's a shame. I was really hoping that you know, the more educated you are to a, to a modality that you're not, that isn't as popular, um, that you might not be exposed to might increase that. And I think it's a shame. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What it's one of the, you know, the, the barriers to getting more patients on home dialysis, especially mm -hmm. PD. I'll tell you, I'm just gonna, you know, I just want to say one thing is so from, you know, and Tom can talk about this too, but 35 or how many Lord knows years I've been doing this. I can't always, I can't predict who's going to thrive on PD. Um, and it's very easy to fall back into this is not a good PD candidate. This is not a good PD candidate for some social reason or something. And people will surprise you. I've had people that are, that I would have predicted done very well and they do very, they don't do well. And people that don't do well and they do well. And you, you know, you look at their socioeconomic, economic background and their, and their whatever else. And I don't know. I don't, I, I, it, it my predictive value is pretty bad. I'm not very good at it. And so 
if I want to try to get somebody on PD, I try to talk them into it and say, you know what, let's go this route. If it doesn't work out, we can always switch. You're not tied to it, but if you, but I'm pretty sure if you go, if I throw you over on my hemodialysis, you're never going to give this a shot. Mm -hmm. And if I've got the relationship for them to try, then they try. And, and yeah, I mean, I've had some disasters, but I've also had some big surprises and I've had some disasters that weren't predicted either, either medical or social or whatever, you know, patients you assume are going to be compliant that aren't and vice versa. So, I mean, you know, I think the goal here is to grow our home program. And that's kind of the, you know, the basis for a lot of what we're going to, we talk about in these groups. Um, I think you have to, I think you have to be, you have to push, push our patients a little bit, you know, and again, getting back to my original statement about, oh, patients have to decide, we have to give them full autonomy. You know, it's just my opinion. That's a little, we've gone a little too far. I think that, I think, um, I think that we need to kind of be a little, we have to be somewhat directive to our patients and give them what we think is best. And, you know, and not just leave it in their hands, because a lot of times people take the easy route out. I'd be curious if Tom agrees with me, or am I just showing my age? Well, uh, uh, not only do I agree with you, but let me, let me, uh, I'm sorry, I'm having to wear a mask because of some other things going on. <laughs> <laughs> but let's see, it, let me, let me try and blend what Roger's saying uh, to, to both concepts of autonomy and, and paternalism. But one, sometimes people will say to you, well, doctor, what do you think I should do? And they've had their education process, so they're fairly knowledgeable. And when they ask that question, I, I asked them a question back. I said, well, now, do you mean what, would, what do you think I should do if I were you? Or what do you think I should do if I were me? And, and then they'll answer, well, what, what would you do? And uh, that's, I tell them what I would do, and I tell them why. Uh, the, the, uh, if they say, well, what, what do you think I should do? Then I would say, well, you, that, that's what Dr. Rodby just said. You, you just got invited to make a recommendation to them. When you make a recommendation, I would tell them why. I, mm -hmm. I think that this would be a very viable option for you because of this, this, and this. And so uh, it, it's easy to throw back on them the invitation to make a recommendation where then, then you've sort of avoided the paternalism because they've asked you the question, what do you think I should do? You see, uh, and I, I just think that's the, the right way to go. Uh, but, but knowing your patients is everything. And I wanna come back to knowing your patients. And Peter can tell you this and Alistair because they, they know it from my clinic. So the first question I ask people after hello is where do you live? because uh, our patients could live a long ways away. And so those frequent visits that we were uh, promoting become more difficult. Now you can do frequent visits. Now it, you can do it telehealth a little bit, but the frequency of the visit is important. And so knowing uh, uh, things about them, uh, wh who's their major advisor? Is it their spiritual advisor? Is it their physician, their spouse? their adult children. Those are the kinds of things that help is knowing your patients. Obviously, you know them medically, but I'm talking about knowing them as people. Uh, that's how you build trust. So, mm -hmm. so I, think there, I think you can blend what you say, Roger. I don't think it has to be a, a one or the other. Well, one thing I just wanna uh, add uh, to answer Roger's question, it's a, it's a question to Anna now. So. If you look at this table, right, uh, in the pre-test group, you have 25.7 that said PD. Post-test, it was up to 36.5, right? Mm -hmm. um, did they comment on, and then for HD, it went from 22.9 to 42.9, right? The biggest drop, as expected, would be in the patients who were not sure, right? It went from 47.1 to 15.9. And uh, my question is, did they comment on how much of that growth in PD or HD came from the, the counterpart? So how many HD, how many people who were part of this 22.9 HD pretest contributed to that rise in PD to 36.5? Or is the answer really what you said, just one in each, and the rest is all explained by those who are not sure? but then we're able to make a decision. Yeah, so I, I think it was just that they only commented on one participant, each had switched to the other option from what I've read in the paper. 
which which then I, I guess would argue that I mean the when when we're going in to educate the patient, right? Um, do we want the patient to be informed in their decision and have less conflict? Right? I mean, yes. I would assume the answer is yes. But then also, uh, now we're a little disappointed because we assume that the more you know, the more likely you are to pick PD or a home without in general. Mm -hmm. Right? But that's not the case in this particular study. But there are a number of studies where, you know, 70% of patients would choose PD or home email. Now, whether or not they end up on it, that's a different mm. story altogether, right? But this is just based on their choice. Mm -hmm. You have only just over a third choosing, uh, choosing PD. Um, and then to, uh, to, to the question of, you know, a very common question that we get from patients is like, you know, what would you do? Right, and I just, one nuance that I just wanna make sure is, is important to point it out is when a patient asks you, what would you do? It's what would you do if you were in my position? Mm -hmm. Right, based on what you know about me, right? So normally if there are gaps in knowledge that you need to know in order to be able to figure out what you think is best for the patient, you know, then things that Dr. Golper asks from the get-go, like, you know, like, where do you live? Who do you live with? What's going on, right? That's when you bring up those questions because, you know, it's not really what would you do in your, in your circumstance, right? Because you're a completely different person, completely different preferences, all that stuff. When patients ask me, if, if you were to go on dialysis, which one would you choose? My response normally is, okay, I would probably do PD, but my life is very different from yours. So let's, like, let's, figure out what best is suited for you mm -hmm. because just i am a proponent of home but i would much rather you do you know three times a week hemodialysis that you're consistent with and you're not missing treatments you're not having any problems compared to having you do pd and just have like a disaster three four months you're unhappy you went through all this procedure all this teaching all that stuff and then you're like well, this was never even right for me in the first place. I don't think that I'm doing you a service by having you take, you know, one one route or the other if that's not going to work for you. You know, ultimately, we had clear red flags. Surprises are, you know, they're there all the time. But if there are clear things that can stand in the way, you know, then, you know, then I, I think it, it's better to just keep that mind open and I would rather you have less conflict and you're sh more sure of your decision than going in because I told you to. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you everyone. Right. Thank, thank you. you very much, Anna. You did a fantastic I, job. Yes, nice job, Anna. <laughs>